the United States arguably ceased to exist as a result of the Great War. And as the violence of the atomic war faded away, people thought of themselves no longer as citizens of the United States. Instead, groups and factions formed across the wasteland, striving to make a place for themselves and their people. And as the factions grew, the need for communication, dialogue, and essentially bilateral relations grew, as these factions came to look at one another as foreign powers, rather than the ancestors of one singular country. So how do each of these factions engage in diplomacy in the Fallout universe? Starting off, we have the Institute. Originally, the Institute did want to establish positive relationships with the communities and groups of the Commonwealth. When a coalition of these groups proposed a united government named the Commonwealth Provisional Government, the Institute willingly agreed and sent their own representatives to support their initiative. However, despite early encouragement, the CPG began to unravel. Four years of bickering and infighting led to the coalition gradually coming undone. However, not all in the Institute had given up on them. A log of the then director details a division head exclaiming that although the CPG was falling apart, it would be a mistake to hide underground and no longer interact with the surface. Instead, the synths could be sent above ground to patrol the Commonwealth and bring order to it. The recording ends with a plea to the director that they can't give up on the people above ground, which unfortunately was what ended up happening. The exact details are unclear, but according to the Commonwealth residents, the catalyst for the CPG's breakup was due to a synth agent massacring the other representatives. The Institute makes no mention of this, with Sean instead stating that they once tried to make a stable Commonwealth government, which fell apart on its own. Nevertheless, the event of the CPG led to the mutual distrust between the Institute and the Commonwealth residents. Their relations with the people of the Commonwealth is one of cold, undiluted apathy. In the labs of the Institute, the people of the Waste are viewed as test subjects at best and collateral damage at worst. An immeasurable number of innocents have been abducted from their homes for the purpose of usage in their scientific experiments. Some are turned into super mutants via FEV and then turned loose on the world above. Others are tortured for information, killed, and replaced with a synthetic replica who takes their place above ground. In other cases, an individual or settlement may come into possession with tech or data that the Institute wishes to acquire. The destroyed settlement of University Point was one such example. A young scavenger found important pre-war data, and the Institute sent a representative to the town to force them to give up the data. The town went into a frenzy to try to turn the scavenger and data over to the Institute, who had disappeared, which led to an army of synths wiping them out. Although most wastelanders are considered, in their words, the remnants of a dying past, not all are deemed fit only for research or destruction. The Institute does employ a robust network of informants above ground, who relay information in exchange for protection and remuneration. For example, nearly every main caravaneer who plies the routes of the Commonwealth is actually an informant to the Institute. The Institute is even open to outside recruitment in very rare circumstances. T.S. Wallace is a gifted wastelander who is a self-taught chemist, biologist, and engineer who the Institute had identified as the ideal candidate to join their ranks. The recruitment method is somewhat lacking, however, as the invitation involves sending synth soldiers to his residence to forcibly teleport him into the Institute. Madison Lee evidently joined the Institute between the events of Fallout 3 and 4 on her own volition and rose to be a head of division within this time frame. Mistrust evidently runs deep, as members of her team will comment that Outsiders such as her should have never been admitted into the Institute if she does defect to the Brotherhood. Ultimately, the Institute's diplomatic relations do not extend further than apathetic acceptance for members outside of their faction. Groups such as the Brotherhood of Steel and the Railroad who are deemed a threat to their interests are dealt with harshly. No diplomatic overtures are ever sought. Instead, one is their airship destroyed by their own robot, and the other is massacred in their own HQ. An Institute ending shows the Director, or sole survivor, issuing a radio address to the people of the Commonwealth, stating that the Institute has no interest in interfering with their daily lives and merely asks that they do not interfere with their operations. However, despite the seemingly laissez-faire approach to stewardship of the Commonwealth, it isn't necessarily seen in practice. Since soldiers will patrol the roads of the Commonwealth, while the larger city of the region, Diamond City, is occupied by their troops, their relations with the outside world are essentially summed up as, don't mess with us, but we will mess with you whenever we deem it scientifically viable to do so. 
Existing since the pre-war era, the Enclave is a clandestine cabal of fascists who consider themselves to be the legal continuation of the United States government. With advanced weaponry, power armor, and a fleet of vertebrates, the Enclave have been a power to reckon with in the wasteland. However, while they do consider themselves to be the United States government, they by and large don't consider the people of the Waste to be their citizens. Following the Great War, the Enclave operated in near total isolation, with the bulk of its power and personnel concentrated at Control Station Enclave, off the coast of California. And during this isolation, the organization's extremely xenophobic and nationalistic culture festered, with many members coming to view the inhabitants of the wasteland as degenerate mutants fit only for slave labor or extermination. As such, the Enclave have difficulty maintaining diplomatic relations with outside groups. Interactions with them are usually on a shoot first and don't ask any questions later basis. That being said, not all wastelanders are deemed necessary for extermination. Some are deemed fortunate enough for more lucrative opportunities. For example, the entire tribal tribe of Arayo were abducted for usage as test subjects, while other wastelanders were lucky enough to be used for slave labor in their Mariposa military base. The Enclave do allow some form of trade with wasteland societies, given the fact that they are found trading laser pistols with the Salvatore crime family in exchange for chemicals. However, this was not on the basis of making a conducive relationship. President Dick Richardson states the hope that if the mutant mobsters use our guns to kill each other, it just saves us the trouble. The Enclave therefore underestimated the groups of the wasteland as near mutants worthy only of enslavement or extermination but it was ultimately this underestimation that spelled their doom. The Chosen One, a lowly tribal, detonated the Enclave oil rig. The remaining Enclave forces remained at Navarro until the NCR, a mere nation of upstarts, rose up to force them out. And hounded by the NCR and the Brotherhood, the majority of the Enclave forces were led by Colonel Autumn Senior to Washington DC, while others made their lives in frontier societies such as the Mojave. In 2277, the Enclave reignited conflict with the Brotherhood of Steel in Washington DC, seizing control of the water purifier in a bid to lay claim to the region. Interestingly though, there was disagreement within the Enclave's high command on how to approach the wasteland population. While President Eden, the secret Zack supercomputer, espoused a message of reuniting America under the Enclave's leadership, his modus operandi for common folk was the same as usual. The water purifier was planned to be used as a tool to kill all that the Enclave considered a mutant, ranging from ghouls to regular human beings who lived above ground, and allow the pure humans of the Enclave to secure the ways. In contrast, Colonel Autumn, the second in command, disagreed with this plan. He instead sought to use the water purifier as a bargaining chip to unite the wasteland residents under Enclave rule, ostensibly ruling over the population as a dictatorship, but without genociding them completely. This does still show the lack of diplomatic importance the Enclave has for outside relations, as the fact that Colonel Autumn didn't want to completely eradicate the wasteland population is honestly quite a big step for the group. The only time that the Enclave actually unite with any other wasteland groups, such as their enemies the Brotherhood of Steel and the NCR, is in one specific circumstance. Remnants of the Enclave can be convinced to join forces with the NCR and by proxy the Brotherhood in the Battle of Hoover Dam against Caesar's Legion. Alternatively, the Enclave can also engage in one of their few diplomatic endeavours by choosing instead to ally with Caesar's Legion, with one of its members delighted to side with a nation of slavers if it meant attacking the Republic. As a humanitarian faction who strives to bring the torch of education and healing to the wasteland, the followers of the Apocalypse are very popular. Foreign relations are therefore an incredibly strong area for the followers, as they are welcomed into nearly all wasteland communities. However, there is one faction that likes them least of all, who were once as close as lips and teeth to them. Once upon a time, the NCR and the followers of the Apocalypse enjoyed very close relations. Forming within the Boneyard, the followers helped shape the NCR as it began to take its first steps as a nation. Their goal of providing education and knowledge directly helped shape the NCR itself, with the Boneyard's university educating many of the NCR's scientists, engineers and technicians. However, as the NCR grew, so too did their desire for expansion. And while the followers wished to allow wastelanders the opportunity for self-determination, the NCR sought to bring more communities, ostensibly under their protection, but outwardly under their control. As the NCR moved into the Mojave, they began to put down roots in the region, occupying territory and communities, with many locals viewing them as an imperialist power. 
Relations therefore deteriorated, as this flew in the face of all that the followers of the apocalypse held to be important. In contrast, although many NCR scientists were educated in followers' institutions, a large portion became disillusioned with, with the followers' focus on knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Rather than teaching people irrelevant topics such as a tribal language and giving that knowledge away for free, focus should be on topics relevant to the NCR government itself, such as energy, transportation, and of course military applications. Things came to a head in 2275, when the NCR and the followers cut ties. The followers withdrew all support, while the NCR set up their own branch, labelled the Office of Science and Industry. In the present day, the NCR view the followers as destructive anarchists focused on eroding public support for the NCR, while the followers view themselves as the janitors of the NCR. They enter a region, ruin things, and then the followers of the apocalypse are left to clean up the pieces. An area that the followers have gained an immense amount of goodwill due to said cleanup efforts is Freeside. Being a region neglected by Mr. House and experiencing the full brunt of NCR settlers, Freeside is a lawless ruin filled with junkies, prostitutes, gangsters, and murderers. And yet even in the filth, the followers see the opportunity to teach and heal. Setting up in the ruins of the old Mormon fort, the followers provide free medical care, shelter, and food to the needy. They are continually under the pump, under-resourced, understaffed, but striving to make a difference. However, their optimism breeds immense goodwill. The King's gang help maintain order in Freeside, and go out of their way to protect and support the followers. Even the most jaded, centuries-old ghoul claims that she doesn't know how they do what they do. This extends even to quite brutal tribals such as the Great Khans. Although known for raiding and pillaging, the followers of the Apocalypse made an effort of outreach to the Great Khans. The Khans were taught how to read, write, do basic math, and basic science. However, this added an unintended side effect as the Khans became very adept at chemistry, and swiftly entered the chem trade. That said, they still appreciated the benevolence of the followers, even if they did use their knowledge not for good. The only two factions that have a more hostile relationship with the followers of the Apocalypse would be Caesar's Legion and the Brotherhood of Steel. Caesar himself was born as a follower, and became a dictator following a series of wacky events in the Grand Canyon, and yet he never lost his appreciation for knowledge that the followers instilled in him. He states that his goal as a follower was to bring the torch of knowledge to mankind. It's just, he ended up taking the torching part a bit more literal than they intended. The followers of the Apocalypse hate Caesar, with many deriding him as a deluded old man trying to rehash the Roman Empire, but Caesar himself does not mind them. If sold as his personal slave, Caesar truly enjoys Arcade Ganon's company, as they engage in intellectual sparring matches. Arcade is one of the few people Caesar genuinely mourns when he dies. If alive for a legion victory in the Mojave, the followers of the Apocalypse are permitted to leave the region unmolested out of a sense of respect for his old faction. However, the same is not true if Caesar does not survive. Linnaeus tires of Arcade's wit and has him killed, while the followers are massacred for defaming the original Caesar's origins. Lastly, although they don't have too much engagement, the followers of the Apocalypse and the Brotherhood of Steel are not on the best of terms. Ideologically, they're a complete opposite. The Brotherhood hoards tech and knowledge, believing mankind will repeat its mistakes if they have access to it. The followers in reverse believe that, unless knowledge is taught to all, then they're doomed to keep making the same mistakes. More zealous Brotherhood members will even massacre a follower's outpost in the event that Veronica expresses interest in joining them, purely out of fear of a former Brotherhood member sharing any of their secrets with the followers of the Apocalypse. Being the ancestors of the crew of a beached Chinese submarine, the Shi are an incredibly unique faction. Their clothing, customs, language are reflective of their cultural background, while their society structure is feudalistic, centered around a computer known as the Shi Emperor. However, in terms of foreign relations, the Shi are not the biggest fans of this. They've retained their own unique sense of self by limiting contact with outsiders from their group. They're described as being insular and isolationist in nature, preferring to focus on their own people than to try to make any power plays in the waste. However, they are open to some dialogue and communication with the Wasteland residents in certain circumstances. The Chosen One is able to work with the Shi, completing quests for the group, and is even permitted to be given access to the Shi Emperor. And this is notable, as only the most inner circle members of the Shi learn that the Emperor is not a man at all, but a computer. In later years, Conrad Kolog mentions in a flashback that he is running security jobs for the Shi, showing their ability to outsource contractors rather than continue to rely on their own people. 
The one group that the Xi outwardly hate are the Hubologists. Modelled on a certain real world religion, the Hubologists are a super weird group with some super weird beliefs. And since the Xi are staunchly pragmatic on scientific matters, while the Hubologists dive headfirst into pseudoscience, relations fray between the two. Ken Lee, the Xi's head advisor, even states that the Hubologists kidnap and abduct Xi children to fill their ranks, and asks that the Chosen One kills their leader. As for the rest of the people of San Francisco, they don't mind the Xi, they just don't have that much to do with them. While well, some people are permitted to work with them and sometimes even sell their power armor that they restore, the rest of the population of the wasteland have very few interactions with the Xi, and the Xi prefer it this way. And that is all the foreign relations of these factions so far. There are evidently quite a few factions to mention that I didn't get around to, partly because the video felt like it would be too long. Obviously, the NCR, Legion, and Brotherhood will be in a future video, but please let me know if there's any other factions whose foreign relations you'd like analysed. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.